Hello everybody and welcome to this video looking at presidential elections and their significance and obviously this is going to be a really key topic with the 2020 election and just around the corner and a lot of the um, key issues that we'll look in here will help you understand that election as it goes through. So I'm looking at the A-level specification for A-level politics and it tells us what you need to know. You need to know the main process is to elect a US president, including the constitutional requirements, the invisible primary, primaries and caucuses, the role of the National Party Conventions and the Electoral College and the resulting party system. And we're going to look at almost all of that. We're going to save the party system for a, uh, a later video. But we're going to look at all the different stuff about the constitutional requirements and the invisible primaries and primaries and caucuses and the National Convention and the Electoral College. And with a, a bit of a warning that some of that's going to be a bit weird this time. Right. So the constitutional requirements on this page are in red. So you need to be a natural born citizen. And uh, you will have seen that we have various conspiracy theories which Trump has um, delve back into have it he was key in promoting um the conspiracy that obama hadn't been uh, wasn't a natural born american which of course he is um and he's now uh it started aiming similar things uh, at uh, kamala harris uh, the uh, vice president running candidate running with biden you have to be 35 years old or older um, you need to have lived in the US for the last 14 years. So if, if you're a, a natural born citizen, but you've moved away and you've not been living in the States, you can't then immediately come back and run. Uh, and you can only stand if you've not already served two terms. And this goes back to uh, an amendment brought into the Constitution following uh, the time in office of FDR. So those bonds, the, the bonds on, my, on, my, on the screen that are in red, they are the actual constitutional requirements. Now, the, the, there are other kind of requirements that really you need, but they aren't constitutional ones. You really need the, uh, the party, one, one of the major two parties to endorse you. So unless you are the Republican or the Democrat candidate in the modern world, you haven't really got much of a hope. Um, you need to be able to raise large sums of money or simply to have large sums of money, which you can spend on campaigning because campaigning is incredibly expensive. You need some form of charisma. So you need either a speaking ability or to come well across well on TV and to appeal to a large number of people. Now, you may look slightly confused at this if you think about some of the um, presidents that we've had. But that is that is the case. You need to appeal to people. And normally uh, you need experience and popular policies. Um, Eisenhower and Trump are, are really the uh, the two exceptions to the experience one. And although you may not necessarily look at it, ex think it's the case from uh, looking from outside, but they, they, they will have had policies that will have been popular across wide numbers of people. Right. So all the different stages of the presidential election is a lot more complicated than a uh, UK general election. So to start off with, the candidates will declare their intention to run. And at that point, they're, they're looking to see whether they can build support, both in terms of numbers of people who are willing to vote for them and also numbers in terms of dollars that people they are going to be able to raise to back them. Uh, and this kind of phony war goes on through uh, what's known as the invisible primaries, where you'll, you'll see um, various candidates trying to stoke up some support. They then go into the primaries and caucuses themselves. And in these, you get essentially election campaigns running inside the two major parties. So there will be Democrat primaries, and there will be Republican primaries. There, there haven't really been this time because there's an, in, an incumbent. Um, president, but there has been, they're, they're, they have gone through the motions with that. Um, once a, um, a candidate has come out victorious from the primaries and caucuses, then they will choose their vice presidential candidate uh, to run alongside them. They will then go to the National Party Convention uh, and they uh, that will confirm the presidential candidate, the vice presidential candidate and the platform on which they're going to stand. You then go into the general election campaign you then get to election day and then you have all the calculations done through the electoral college voting system so it is quite a long process it can go on for really quite a long time invisible primaries are a really important stage in the uh, electoral uh, campaign 
So once the candidate is announced, they, they enter this invisible primary in which um, can, and this can take place a long time before the actual primary. So, for example, uh, in the 2016 race, Ted Cruz announced he would run for the Republican candidacy back in March 2015. Um, Hillary Clinton, who was um, selected as, as the Democrat candidate, de declared back in April um, 2015. Now, there's a variety of things that take place during the invisible uh, primaries. Now, some of them are invisible and some of them aren't really. Um, so there's fundraising. You, you need to be able to, to raise tens of millions of dollars. Um, so, for example, by, by January the 1st, 2016, uh, Trump had raised twenty five and a half million um, dollars for his campaign. And he'd also spent 18 million dollars of his own, um, which is not a small amount of money. One of the big pushes for any candidate in, in the um, invisible primaries is to try and gain some kind of name recognition. So <clears throat> this can be quite difficult for um, some um, some um, potential candidates and some politicians. Um, you're trying to get mentioned in the media. You're trying to build some kind of momentum. Obviously, if you are instantly recognisable and have got a name already, either through politics or through other spheres like a TV show like Trump did, then it is easier to build that kind of name recognition going up. There are a series of TV debates held between the party's candidates, and these can be rather uh, make or break. Uh, it tends to favour sound bites over real policies at this point, and we we do often get some um, rather unpleasant infighting in between candidates of the same party at this point in time. The candidates will also be looking to get endorsements from leading party figures, be that former presidents or, or, or kind of other big voices within the party. There will be lots and lots of opinion polls being run. Uh, and they will be frequently done to, to measure the progress of different candidates during the primaries. And the person who is leading in terms of opinion polls to, towards the end of the invisible primaries tends to actually go on and win the candidacy. Um, and that was not always the case. Only, for example, in 2008 was a slight oddity in this where Hillary Clinton and uh, Rudy Giuliani, who came out of the invisible primaries as the front runners, Neither of them went on to gain the candidacy in, the, in that year, but normally uh, the front runner does. Now, the 2020 invisible primaries are quite interesting. Um, it was quite clear that, that Trump would be the candidate uh, as he was unofficially endorsed by the Republican National Committee back in January 2019. There were some other candidates that announced, so um, uh, Bill Weld and then um, uh, Rocky de, la, de, de, de Fincher, um, I think I said that horribly wrong, um, uh, Joe Walsh uh, in August 2019 uh, and Mark Sanford in September 2019. Now, none of these really gained any serious support. No real big hitter kind of came in uh, to take uh, on Trump and therefore on the Republican side, uh, this was fairly smooth. And, and you can say of Trump that he, he's really essentially been campaigning uh, since 2016 uh, with his, his frequent rallies that he that he holds in in states where he, he's very popular uh, and, and he causes a bit of a media storm with that. And he, he goes and says um, things that capture headlines in terms of the Democrats. Well, the, the invisible primaries in 2020 were really interesting because they had their largest field ever, about 29 uh, candidates. Uh, the key battle was between uh, the moderate and progressive sides of the Democrat Party, and it really is quite a divided uh, party on a number of issues. And the moderate side was mainly uh, represented uh, by uh, Biden, and the progressive side was largely represented by Sanders, and other candidates kind of fell by the wayside, and those two really emerged coming into uh, the primaries. Um, Kamala Harris performed re really well in some of the early te televised debates, and gained that kind of name recognition and some some support. They're not able to uh, ultimately compete with Biden and Sanders, but obviously has now uh, been named as a vice pres presidential candidate. So primaries and caucuses, this is where the, the kind of the, the real stuff starts following the invisible bit uh, beforehand, where we've, we, we, we actually start to see some voting take place. So a primary is a state based election uh, to choose the party's candidate, uh, and this shows uh, support amongst ordinary voters. 
Democrats awards delegates in proportion to the vote in the state, uh, whilst Republicans traditionally uh, do winners takes all um, primaries, though some states are now using a more proportional system. Uh, Trump has called for this to be extended uh, in the Republican Party. Uh, and we get different types of primaries. We get open primary where any voter in the state can choose uh, to vote in either the Democrat or Republican primary. This happens in South Carolina, in Alabama, or in Texas. You have semi-closed ones where voters are rigid, registered uh, supporter or independents can take part, and that happens in New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. So if you register as an independent, it means each each election that comes, you can choose. I, I'm going to vote in the Republican one, or I'm going to vote in uh, the Democrat ones with with open and semi uh, semi closed primaries, you can get some slightly odd results where you might get lots of negative voting where a, a, a Democrat supporter might decide to um, vote for a Republican candidate who they think uh, is going to be really unattractive to the electorate to try and push them through or so on. But they would then lose their opportunity to vote in the Democrat one. In a closed primary, you need to have registered as a supporter of the party, uh, and this is generally done uh, many um, many months um, before the actual primary takes place. And this is used in Louisiana and Florida and New York. So primaries absolutely dominate, uh, and they they are probably the most democratic way of doing it. Obviously, the more open it is, the more dem the more democratic it would appeal, because it, it, you're trying to appeal across a wider group of people. And the open primaries tend to have the highest voter turnout. The other method used is the caucuses. Now, these happen as a series of public meetings. There's a debate and then there's a vote. Uh, the, the vote is non-secret. It tends to be through raising hands or standing in a particular part of the hall to, to show which side that you support tends to be um, more popular with activists and, and the, the very most committed voters, some of whom can be a little bit more more extreme than the norm. Uh, it tends to be used in, in low, more lowly populated states in Iowa, Nevada and Colorado. It's definitely seen as being far less democratic than the primary. And one of the calls for making the system a bit more democratic is to, to remove caucuses uh, and move to primaries being used in all states. As you can also see, it is slightly confusing because you have different systems operating in different states. So <clears throat> primaries and caucuses, caucuses don't directly elect a candidate, but select delegates to go to the national convention. So again, and we get a lot of this with American politics, where, where you kind of get a two-stage um, electoral process, and we'll see it again when we do the electoral college. But so in the primary and the caucuses, you are not choosing the candidate directly. You are choosing delegates who will vote for that candidate in a national convention. Um, and Democrats have, have recently stopped superdelegates, who are unelected delegates, normally about 15% of the delegates in the, in the Democrat election, from voting on the first round in the con in conventions. Now, the National Convention used to select the, well, does still select the candidate, but normally the result is well known before the convention. So that's quite a significant move. Um, different states hold primaries on different days. Um, some states go early to gain, gain greater significance, Iowa and New Hampshire, for example. Um, some uh, group together, such as uh, uh, Super Tuesday that takes place in February or March, which is the, the largest gathering of um, votes on the one day. There are advantages to the primary system. It, it, it means that uh, candidates have to show that they have a proven ability and electability. Um, it raises key political issues and tests them out, and this can be important for the platforms of the parties going into the main election. Um, and it, it offers voter choice, and it, this increases participation, and it gives, for example, the, the Democrats, it gives them a, a clear idea of which faction is most popular at this point in time. There are disadvantages, however. It really exposes internal divides, and often the infighting within the party can be really fierce during the primary and caucus season. And it's quite difficult then to go back to all being smiley and happy at the national convention and backing each other going into uh, the, the national election. Um, as I said already, it can be confusing because it's different in di for different states. Um, the timing can be a big issue because you can get um, voter fatigue because it seems to go on forever. 
dif you di almost disenfranchise people who, in whose primaries are later in the process if we end up with a, a, a clear leader by that point um, they are very very expensive to run all through all these covering all the distance over the states and all the different um, campaigns in the different states and you do get um, uh, scandals for example the uh, Nevada uh, for the Democrats in 2016 there are where they have three stages to the selection process and um, Clinton won the first stage but then a lot of her, de her the people, her delegates didn't turn up for the second stage, which meant that Sanders won the second stage, which he shouldn't have done because Clinton had won the initial vote. And then they changed the rules part way through when Sanders delegates were deselected and it was all very messy. Uh, and the Iowa caucus in, in 2020, uh, again, saw some real issues with the announcing of the result and the counting of the, uh, the counting of the votes as it went through on an, an app they were using. So they're not free from controversy. Choosing a vice presidential candidate is obviously a really important stage. And we've seen this uh, very recently in, in America with um, with Kamala Harris being chosen. They're, so they're chosen by the presidential candidate or the incumbent president. Uh, they're, they're now generally announced before the national convention, where they, it used to be they were announced at convention. They need to be confirmed by a majority vote at the national convention, which is, is, is fairly routine uh, nowadays. Uh, their announcement is generally designed to give a boost to the presidential candidate in the polls. It's usually a very big media event, and it's particularly good if they can uh, keep some kind of um, debate going in the media about who's it going to be. And there's some element of surprise when it's announced, and then that can really capture people's imagination and give a bounce in the uh, in the polls. Sometimes uh, presidential candidates are looking for a balanced ticket. So uh, a president and vice president who attract support for different reasons. So. Uh, for example, you can see this with Trump and Pence, where Pence will will keep traditional Republicans on board uh, whilst Trump was out trying to attract new voters or, or people who hadn't previously been voting to the Republican Party. It can be about party unity. So, I mean, we, we could see the, the Biden-Harris ticket uh, as um, and a chance to kind of reconnect the progressives and the moderates together. It can be about potential to govern, so not really about the election campaign, but about really what, what happens uh, if they win. So, for example, Trump's complete political inexperience would be counters by uh, Pence's many years of experience. And that would be similar to the case with George W. Bush and Dick Cheney going back in 2000. And the balance ticket is probably the most important one of those, but they all play um, some uh, role. So the National uh, Party Convention uh, is normally a three or four day event. It's a huge media uh, event. It's aimed to enthuse the party faithful and the electorate about your candidates. Um, the challenging party normally goes first. So, for example, in 2016, uh, the Republicans um, went on the 18th to 21st of July and the Democrats followed on the 28th to the uh, 25th to the 28th. It's been very, very different in 2020 because it's all been delayed due to, due to COVID-19 and they're going to be largely virtual events rather than physical events. And so there's been quite a lot of stuff that you've uh, been following the news about that. Um, the, the general idea is the convention is supposed to choose a presidential uh, candidate. Uh, it's more, normally more of a coronation, a celebration of the candidate rather than a genuine choice. Uh, again, they, they choose the vice president candidate, but this has normally been pre-announced and, and that, that's largely been the case since 1988. And so it's simply confirming the vice presidential candidate and they decide on the platform, which is a bit like a, a manifesto that we have in the UK. Uh, it's uh, put together by the platform committee. It's agreed by the national committee. Parties now try and avoid too many controversial debates on the um, on the convention floor over things. Um, but it's not always the case. And now, different parts of the uh, of the platform are called planks, and we've seen some controversial ones um, uh, recently. Uh, so, we in 2016 we saw a, a Republican uh, plank which called for the overturning of um, the Obergefell um, Hodges case of 2015, which um, gave the constitutional right uh, for same-sex uh, couples in marriage, and the Republican Party was calling for that to be overturned. Uh, and in the Democrats' um, uh, platform, we saw a plank on, on a $15 an hour inflation-linked minimum wage, which is one of the key things that Sanders' um, supporters wanted to get into the platform. 
And so these things can cause a big fuss and seem like a big deal at the time. However, the platform will play a very little role in the election following and, and probably in the following administration. Um, the convention's real job is to create a bounce in the opinion polls. If a if a candidate has see something put on the platform that they don't really like, then they're not going to campaign on it. They're not going to then uh, put it into place when they win. So we've had the national convention, so we go on to the general election campaign. This generally starts on uh, Labor Day, which is the first Monday in September, and runs until the election, which is in early November. It's a nine week campaign, which again in itself sounds like a lot, really long one. But you think we've had invisible primaries and primaries before this. We really are looking into something of fairly epic length. Uh, the media is hugely important in it. Um, there seems to be this tradition of the October surprise in 2000. It was Bush's drink driving conviction being leaked to the media. In 2016, it was the FBI director uh, uh, re reopening an investigation to Hillary Clinton over her use of a private email server. Uh, and so we normally get something which kind of shakes it all up in the middle of the campaign. TV presidential debates, and there is an argument about how uh, impactful these are. There's normally three three presidential ones and one vice presidential one. They can take place in a variety of different styles. Um, they tend to be very important for the challengers who tend to be less well known than any incumbent. So in 2016, we see it, it's quite a good example of it. And these presidential debates attracted a lot of attention because you've got you've not got an incumbent. So you've got um, two essentially new candidates. It can make the difference if the candidate really messes up. And this is seen as one of the reasons why Gore lost in 2000. However, the argument has really re-arisen about how significant they are, because although more people watched in 2016 than had been the case in previous elections, the polls quite firmly said that Clinton had won all three of the debates, but she lost the election. Now, sound bites tend to be uh, to get replayed over and over again by the media and on social media, and so they can actually be more important than any real serious um, uh, policy discussion and and really they are now seen by many political commentators as being more of a show than anything where you're going to get any really serious hard-hitting political debate. Election finances are a rather mind-blowing um, topic. Uh, since the uh, Federal Election Act of 1974, which followed the Watergate cri um, scandal, uh, there's been restrictions on contributions that people and corporations and unions could give and various other aspects of, of uh, federal fina uh, finance for federal elections. And there's a court case in 2014 which actually struck down the limits on a lot of campaign uh, contributions. And so <coughs> the effectiveness of that act has been really damaged. Um, campaign finances can, can go either directly to candidates or to um, national parties or into super PACs and now or PACs and the super PACs are bodies that raise more money in order to elect or defeat a particular candidate and they spend an awful lot of money on ads. Now this really is as I said mind blowing. Super PACs spent 1.5 billion dollars in 2016. There's also an issue of what's something called soft money, which is money that's not directly given to the candidates. Now, the money given to the candidates, there's more restrictions on, but soft money is not given to them, but it's given either to, to national or local parties, and that, that's not limited and can be spent on a number of key things in the election. Candidates' restrictions on spending is only really in place if they take federal matched funding, uh, but in 2012 and 2016, we've seen the candidates that's not take the federal match funding. And so they then don't have the same limits on what they can spend. The scale of the money involved on this issue has led it to being highly controversial. It means the super rich are the most likely people to be successful. It also means that wealthy individuals and interest groups and corporation can be seen to have a huge amount of influence. On election day, uh, it's the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Uh, early voting is allowed in the in a majority of states, about 30 states, and, and in 2016, 47 million votes were cast early. Um, the postal voting is also used, but this is going to be a really, really hot issue going into 2020, with Trump having said on various um, occasions, though not with any supporting evidence, that it, it's going to lead 
to uh, voter voter fraud um, this may be setting himself up with an excuse or reason to challenge the electoral uh, result in 2020. Voter turnout is generally lower than what we see in the UK it was 54% uh, in 2016 uh, it is difficult to de defeat an incumbent. Uh, only three of the last ten, Ford, Carter and Bush Senior, have lost out uh, as incumbents. Uh, and this, uh, they all generally had something that went fairly horrendously wrong. And so there was good reason for them to lose. Uh, and again, this will be something really interesting to look at in 2020. There are a limited number of states known as swing states, and these tend to be the focus in the electoral campaign and particularly on election day. And they get the focus of all the media attention and campaigning, as many of the states are either firmly Democrat or Republican, and therefore there's not a huge amount of media attention or campaigning goes on there. And there's normally a small number of states, around 12, which sometimes are Democrat and sometimes which are Republican, and that's where the campaigning and the media attention tends to go. Now, the actual calculating of the results is not very straightforward. It's not simply a case of winning more votes than your opponent. So, for example, Hillary Clinton beat Trump in the popular vote in 2016, but lost on the Electoral College. Now, each state has a value in the Electoral College, a number of votes, and it is made up of the number of senators, which is always two, added to the number of members of the House of Representatives. Uh, which is determined by the population size of that state. So, for example, uh, California and Texas have far more uh, representatives than um, Rhode Island or uh, Alaska. It does lead this calculation to a distortion of population because it means that the Electoral College votes um, you get disproportionately high number in the very small states, the states with very small populations, compared to the states with very large uh, populations. So that gives a bit of a, a shift in the weighting. Uh, to win, you need to get 270 out of the 538 votes. Most states are winner takes all. The two exceptions are Maine and Nebraska, uh, which use a, a kind of proportional system. Uh, electors meet in their state capital on the Monday after the second Wednesday in December and cast their votes, votes. There is a risk of rogue or faithless electors. Well, there were seven of these in 2016. Um, the vice president is then sent the votes and they count them in early January. Remember, this system was set up um, a couple of hundred years ago when travel and communication were a lot slower. In a case of there being no majority, which has only happened twice, um, uh, the president is elected by the House, one, one vote per state, and the vice president is selected by the Senate. Right, it is a long and complicated system, which means that this is a much longer video than I normally like to do, but I hope it's been useful for you. Uh, if it has, then please like, leave me uh, any comments, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to um, my channel. This A-Level Politics playlist in particular is aiming at covering the entire A-Level specification, so I hope will prove to be really helpful to you in your study and or revision. Thank you very much for watching.